Mr Costello. Uh, Commissioner, the next witness is from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Linda Maria Elkins. Is it Elkins here? Is it Elkins? Uh, do you wish to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the, and truth. Nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yeah. Ms. Elkins, can you give the commissioner your full name, please? Linda Marie Elkins. And your business address? Two O One Sussex Street, Sydney. And have you received a summons to appear today before the Commission? I have. <coughs> do you have a copy of the summons I do. with you? I tender the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.70, summons to Ms Elkins. Ms Elkins, have you given a witness statement that is uh, dated 5 April 2018 to the Commission? I have. I understand that you wish to make a correction to subparagraph 3D of your statement? Yes. What is that correction? Um, I realised I have resigned uh, my directorship from the, well, I'm sorry, my membership of the Financial, Financial Services Council Superannuation Board Committee. Uh, and when did you resign? I think it was effective the 4th of April. Can I ask you to just amend paragraph 3D of your statement to reflect that change? And will you initial that change that you yes. made to the statement? Um, with that change, is your statement true and correct? Yes. Commissioner, I tender the statement and the exhibits to it. The uh, witness statement of Ms Elkins and exhibits? Uh, yes. There and exhibits uh, will be exhibit 2.71. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr Costello. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Ms Elkins, you're the General Manager of Colonial First State. I'm the Executive General Manager of Colonial First State. And you've been in that position since? 2012. And in your witness statement, you mentioned two legal entities, Colonial First State Investments Limited and Avantios, is that the correct That's pronunciation? Right. Investments Limited. Yes. Are you responsible for both of those entities? Yes, I am. And... Um, in the scheme of the Commonwealth Bank, where do those entities sit? Who, to who do you report? I report into the um, Chief Operating Officer of the Wealth Management Division. And who's that? Um, Michael Venter. Right. Now, there are other legal entities with the name Colonial First State within the Commonwealth Bank group. Yes. Is the entity for which you're responsible related in any way to Colonial First State Global Asset Management? Uh, Colonial First State Global Asset Management is also a subsidiary of the of the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, the businesses at one time in the past, the dates I wouldn't remember, uh, were were joined together. These, this was one business that has business that has been split um, over time. Right. So you're not responsible for Colonial First State Global Asset Management. No, not at all. All right. And what is the business of Colonial First State that you're responsible for? I'm responsible uh, for the uh, platform business, to oversimplify it, I guess, for the platforms within Colonial First State. Right. Both the Master Trust and the RAP uh, platform. Is platform a convenient expression to describe both Master Trusts and RAPs? That's correct. All right. And in your witness statement <coughs> at paragraph 13b, you also mention private label RAP products? Yes. What are private label wrap products? Private labels is where um, another entity would be using our administration uh, services, but we're not the trustee or the product issuer. I see. Now, you've been put forward by the Commonwealth Bank to answer some questions that the Commission has put to the bank about platform fees. Yes. Other of those questions will be answered by Ms Perkovic? Yes, that's right. All right. And what was the reason for the division between the two of you? Uh, because of the separation uh, within the business of where responsibilities uh, lie, 
one of the ways we think about uh, management of conflicts within a vertically integrated business is to think about how the businesses need to be split and having different leaders responsible for different um, activities. So the questions you're referring to were in regard to uh, advice business uh, APLs, yes. which is something I have no responsibility or visibility over. When you say APL, you mean approved Sorry, product approved list? Sorry, approved product list. Yes, all right. Um, now, in paragraph 15 of your witness statement, you set out two tables. You can yes. see it either in your hard copy or on the screen, whichever is more convenient to you. And in those tables, uh, you set out which platforms Colonial First State, I might call CFS, okay. um, offers, yes. and which platforms AIL, which is Avantios, offers, and whether they are available to affiliated advisors or unaffiliated advisors. Could you explain to me first, in this context, what you mean by an affiliated advisor? Affiliated uh, with the Commonwealth Bank. An example of an affiliated advisor would be an advisor working within CFPL? Yes, Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited, right. Financial Wisdom, or COUNT, and previously Bank West Financial yes. Advice. Yes, and an unaffiliated advisor is anybody else? Correct. All right. And why is it that some platforms are made available to affiliated advisors, some to unaffiliated advisors and others to both? Uh, the, that only happens in the Avantios uh, part of the business. Yes. And that would be where there's a white label arrangement in place. And if there is a white label arrangement in place, does that mean it would be available only to an unaffiliated advisor? By nature, that white label uh, would be made available uh, to um, the licensee responsible for it. Although it can happen that it is also made available to other advisors, or it can happen that an advisor who is um, affiliated subsequently goes to another licensee but can continue to write the product. But generally, that's right. It's all, all right. I'm not sure I entirely understand the white labelling process yet. Um, if I'm a consumer and I go to an unaffiliated financial advisor and they give me advice to make an investment through a platform and it yes. happens that that plat platform is a white label platform um, manufactured by Avantios. Yes. I won't know that it's Avantios, is that right? It'll be labelled something else. The label would be the relevant white label, but it would be disclosed in the PDS yes. that the administrator uh, or product issuer is <coughs> Avantios and yeah. that that is a subsidiary of the Commonwealth Bank. Would the white label typically be the brand of the unaffiliated advisor? Uh, typically, yes. Right. <coughs> Thank you. I want to ask you a few questions about Sorry, I mean, you can see that I don't think the name is nested the same. Like, it's not, for example, in Count, it's not called the Count White Label, it's called Star Portfolio. So it would be the, the brand name that, that is... The unaffiliated advisor might have a, a platform brand, brand name yes. that they distribute, <coughs> in your, but your entity would be the manufacturer. Yes. Thank you. I want to ask you some questions about platform fees. Generally, what are the type of fees that Colonial, if I can refer to it, Colonial as being both entities, um, charges for platforms? So the fees um, are either administration fees that we charge for running the platform, or we charge fees that we then uh, pass on to service providers such as investment managers um, or insurers. All right. Can I take you to um, an exhibit to your witness statement? It's LME 59, which is CBA <clears throat> this is a spreadsheet that you have exhibited to your witness statement that yes. sets out some fee types for Colonial First State Investment Limited products. In the first one noted there is an investment fee. Yes. Now, what is the investment fee? 
The investment fee is, uh, in this case, we're looking at the CIFSL entity. Uh, the CIFSL entity is a master trust structure and uses a mandate structure in terms of how it purchases the underlying investments. So in that case, the investment fee relates to the fees that would be paid to that underlying investment manager and administration fees paid to us for carrying out the unit price functions <coughs> Excuse me. In relation to those investments, you said it uses a mandate arrangement. Yes. Could you explain what a mandate arrangement is? Yes. So a mandate arrangement is where we buy our own uh, vehicle from the relevant asset manager, rather than investing into one of their existing managed investment schemes. When you say your own vehicle, do you mean you establish a managed investment scheme that is for your particular use? Uh, it, I'm not sure that it's a managed investment scheme. We refer to it as a mandate. It, it, it may be technically, but it's, it's our own um, vehicle with that investment manager as opposed to um, pooling into a, a vehicle with other investors. The investment fee that's listed in this spreadsheet, that's a fee paid by the investor? Uh, it's, it, the, so that when we carry out the unit pricing function, uh, the, the fee that uh, is, is charged is included in that unit price. So it's charged um, across the fund as a whole, as opposed to per individual account. Is the investment fee a one-off fee or is that a recurring fee? That's a recurring fee. And how often would that ordinarily be charged? It's charged monthly. Charged monthly. And what's the basis by which that fee would be calculated? The funds under management. All right. And then the invest the Administration fee is the next fee in the spreadsheet and there are yes. two administration fees noted there. What's the administration fee in a general sense? The administration fee is the, the fee for uh, carrying out the uh, client operations, if you like, for managing the administration services in relation to the client's account. And how often would an administration fee ordinarily be charged? Monthly as well, All part right. of the unit price. And the investment fee and the administration fee are in addition to fees that might be charged by the fund manager, is that right? No, that's included. They're wrapped together? Yeah, so the fee uh, that um, an individual would pay depends on which investment they chose. I see. And would that be the case for all products, all platform products across the Colonial First State portfolio? I believe so, yes. All right. So all uh, consumers that invest through a colonial first state platform, will pay as a general rule an investment fee and an administration fee. Yes. But they will not pay a fee to the ultimate fund manager. Is that right? We pay that fee. Do you pay that yes. fee? So that fee is incorporated what within the Into investment the unit fee. Price, yeah. I see. All right. And the fund manager's fee would ordinarily be calculated by reference to funds under management, or yes. sometimes called funds under administration. Yes. And your investment fee is also calculated in that way? Yes. And is the administration fee calculated yes, in that is. way? And what's the relation? Sorry, I'm sorry? sorry, but you can see here on the exhibit administration fees can be dollar based yes. as well. In some what's more cases. common? A funds under management. And what's the relationship between funds under management and the administration expenses that the platform operator might incur? So the, the main relationship between those things is the, um, I guess, the risk we carry in relation to the unit pricing function that we, we carry out. Uh, and there can be a relationship, although it will vary, between uh, the, the amount of service that would be required on the account. If, if the account balance is higher, there, there can be additional servicing needs, but I would say it's predominantly the risk uh, in relation to the higher amount. All right, so you've mentioned risk and servicing. Can I deal with risk first? What's the risk that you're exposed to? If we get the unit pricing is incorrect, then we would be responsible for the remediation of that. Does that happen often? No, it doesn't. We, um, we, we are, obviously there is audit uh, functions that are, that are carried out uh, with our external auditors and we perform at, uh, we believe we're at industry best practice. Presumably, correct me if I'm wrong, the unit price would be at least in part a function of the total value of the underlying investments. That's right. And it would need to be divided by the number of units issued? Yes. And 
explain to me the other vagaries that create the pricing risk? The, the, if, we got, if we made an error, if we got it wrong. In the division? Or in, um, you know, things like the withdrawal of the administration fee or in the recouping of expenses or wherever it might be. You charge more against the prospect that you might do something wrong. Are we, cha we uh, the question you asked me was what's the relationship? Um, so, I, so no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that, that that is the relationship, and I would also agree that it is industry practice that these mm. fees are asset based. But, but you would also agree that you're pricing in your risk. Yes. Of miscalculation, yes. which might result in a requirement for remediation. Yes. And that affects the price the consumer pays. Yes. And that's the risk component. And the other component was the servicing component. And again, that's not necessarily a direct relationship, but, but it is a factor that can be. As yeah. I would agree <coughs> that using asset-based fees is, is the common method that's used in the industry. What type of services are contemplated by the servicing fee? So the servicing fee covers uh, the administration of the account, so the application uh, process, any redemption process, uh, call centre activity reporting and so on. Um, the application process uh, would not be covered by an initial application fee, is that right? Uh, it's included in, that, in the administration there's fee. There's no separate application no, fee? No, there's not. Um, and is there a separate fee for redemption? No. All right. So uh, historically, there are products. There has been differences over time, but at the moment, no. So entry fees and exit fees have now been merged into an administration fee, and the administration fee also includes call centre out. type activities. Is that your yes. evidence? Yes. Yes. All right. And the administration fee will generally be charged by reference to funds under management. Yes. And is there any relationship between the administrative tasks that Colonial would undertake and the amount of funds under management? As I said, it would, it would vary. I mean, no, this is the standard method that the industry uses. This is almost uniform practice within the industry, isn't it? Almost uniform. There are products that are fee based that are dollar fee-based. Are they newer products as a general yes. rule? Yes. In our case, I, I can't speak for the broader industry. And if I can take another asset class, for example, that a consumer might consider making an investment in, a consumer might have an ability to, say, invest in direct property yes. or invest in a managed fund through one of your platforms. And if the consumer invested in direct property they might appoint a manager to manage the property and that manager might charge a fixed fee, might charge a flat fee or might charge a fee based on rent received, that is the income. But that type of arrangement would almost never involve the, a, a fee based on the capital value of the property acquired. Do you, is that how you would understand a direct property investment to work? That, that I think that's fair, yes. So that's quite a differential method of calculation of fees between that particular type of investment and the type of investment you offer. Yes, that's fair. And the principal reason why funds are, uh, sorry, fees are recouped on the basis that they are is historical practice. Do you agree with that? I think that, yes. All right. And has there been any consideration given to whether or not it remains appropriate to charge fees by reference to funds under management when the costs incurred by the fund manager are not referable to the amount of funds under management? I haven't been involved in those discussions. If there had been discussions within Colonial, would you have been involved? Uh, we, sorry, I should say, obviously we have launched products that are dollar fee uh, based. So our thinking um, around that was uh, that's a new product that we've uh, brought to market to see uh, what, what the appetite for that was. What's that product called? Uh, that's the Comsec Portfolio Service. When did you launch that product? I'm um, sorry, I can't remember the launch date. It was relatively recently. Would it have been this year? No, last, last year. year. All right. And that's the only product you have? Um, other products in the white labels, for example, the uh, arrangement could be a combination of um, asset-based and dollar-based fees. Have you got any products where the investment fee is anything other than a percentage of funds under management? 
Uh, there's uh, term deposits are available on these platforms. Um, so that, that's a different, they're obviously subject to the interest rate. So I want to make sure I understand that. Are you saying if somebody invests in a term deposit through a colonial platform, they're not charged an investment fee based on funds under management? Not the investment fee, they would be charged, um, the admin, they, they can be charged an administration fee, but they wouldn't, they would receive the interest rate that's relevant to that term deposit. That's what they would receive? Yes. My question is what would they pay? Uh, they would pay uh, just an administration fee. All right. Um, can I deal quickly with um, the expenses that Colonial might incur in uh, administering or operating master trusts and platforms? And can I take you to <coughs> Exhibit 56 of your witness statement, which is <coughs> CBA.9000.0003.00001? Are you familiar with this spreadsheet? Yes. Upon seeing it. Um, this is a spreadsheet where you have had <coughs> your staff at Colonial set out um, by totaled categories the expenses incurred uh, in relation to operating your portfolio of platforms. Is that right? This spreadsheet's in relation to CIFSL? Only. Yes. That, that's colonial first state only, yes. not Avantios. Thank you. And you can see at the top uh, in the grey column it says expenses and then it's got a dollar sign and three zeros. So these figures take, for example, the first figure um, for financial year 11 in column six, which says 162,534. That's actually 162 million yes. 534,000 is it? Yes. All right. <clears throat> and then if you go down to row 12, perhaps if rows 12 to 15 could be made a little larger. <clears throat> Thank you. There are commission expenses. Yes. And that starts in financial year 11 and runs through to financial year 17. Yes. Um, and it's broken into two categories, related parties and third parties. Yes. Related parties are other Commonwealth Bank entities, is that what that means? That's the advice um, entities that we described before. CFPL, Count, Count Financial Wisdom. Financial Wisdom and formerly BWFA, formerly which was yeah. Bank West. All right. So your business to take... Uh, financial year 11 to begin with, paid, what's that, $53 million in commissions to other Commonwealth Bank entities? That's right. Is that right? Yes. Um, and in that same year it paid $127 million, $127.5 million nearly in commissions to third parties. That means unaffiliated advisors, right. does it? All right. Um, and you can see that the figures continue through to financial year 17. Now, beyond financial year 13, once FOFA commenced, yes. are these grandfathered commissions? They are. And do they include volume-based shelf space fees? No, they are just the commissions. Do you pay volume-based shelf space fees? We're grandfathered volume-based fees we do. You don't pay volume-based shelf space fees otherwise? No. And why is that? Because FOFA. But you're aware, aren't you, that there are two exceptions to the general prohibition on volume-based shelf space fees? Are you aware of that? Uh, 
so, or where where they're covered. Where, the where, where you are, provision. where it is still permissible for. Oh yes, I'm sorry. For yes, them to be we, paid. We pay those. Yes. You, you still do pay them. We do if they're right. permitted under FOFA. So beyond. 1st of July 2013, these figures would be both grandfathered commissions and permissible volume-based shelf space fees? No, the volume-based um, uh, rebates, I don't believe, are in, in those numbers. We can confirm that, but I don't believe so. I believe that's just the commissions. Do you receive volume-based shelf space fees? Are we From fund managers, yes. you mean? Uh, we, yes, we, we do, prior to... Uh, them ceasing as well under FOFA. Yes, and to the extent they're still permissible, do you still receive? We do, and they, there's, um, in my witness statement, they are described. Yes, thank you. Do you have an understanding of the exceptions to the ban on volume-based shelf space fees? Yes. Could you perhaps explain to the Commissioner, so far as you're able, what a volume-based shelf space fee is? I'm not asking what a permissible one is, I'm just asking as a general concept, what is the concept? The concept was that um, fund managers uh, were, were paid us for um, access onto the platform and for the carrying out of administration tasks in relation to that. All right. And who do you pay volume-based shelf space fees to now? to the two licensees where that is uh, permitted under the grandfathering provisions. And who do you pay commissions to? The same, to the licensees where, where that's permitted under FOFA. All right. I want to ask you a few questions about charging of fees. That spreadsheet can come down now, thank you. Can I take you to paragraph 30 of your witness statement, which is at CBA 9000-0008-0001 at 0011? Actually, if we could go back one page first, I'll just show you the question that you're responding to <coughs> here. Can you see question five there? <coughs> just make it a little larger. Thank you. Um, you were asked this question, in respect of each identified RAP platform or master trust during the period of 2011 to date, what are the systems or procedures that govern whether a fee identified in answer to 3A above, that 3A above is where you set out the general fees that you charge for your platforms, is automatically charged to a client and how it is or was, or how is or any, or was any fee calculated? And then we asked you to expand on your initial answer in uh, A1 there by saying how members authorise Colonial or Avantios to deduct an advisor service fee or an ongoing advisor fee? That was the question, and if I can take you to paragraph 30 of your statement now. You said there, you can see, members are required to authorise the payment by Colonial or Avantios, as the case may be, of any advisor service fee, including any ongoing advisor service fees to any dealer group or financial advisor. Just pausing there, when you say members are required, who are members? Customers, investors. Right, investor. I see. Members of the fund? Yes. Uh, this authority can only be given by a member via appropriately executed request. This authority is typically included as part of the application form for an interest in the relevant offering, but may be provided in a standalone document. So, in addition to any fees that you charge as platform operator, an advisor service fee might also be deducted from the value of the client's investment. Is yeah, that well right? There's been an agreement between the, um, the customer and their advisor, uh, then they can authorise us to deduct that fee. I see. And where is it deducted from? Uh, in the case uh, of CIFSL, 
uh, from, by redeeming units from their uh, account. In the case of uh, Avantios, the wrap business, from the cash account that it operates through. I see. Colonial's ability to deduct fees from clients' investments is in effect what allows ongoing service fee relationships to work in a practical sense, isn't it? That's right. You're the conduit between the client's money and the payment of the ongoing service fee? Yes. All right. And you would appreciate that ongoing service fees are a very significant income stream for advisors? Yes. And a very significant income stream for other Commonwealth bank entities such as CFPL? Yes. All right. Can I take you to paragraph 31 of your statement now, please? Uh, sorry, 31. This is now in respect of fee disclosure statements or renewals. You yes. say there the fee recipient, that is the financial advisor or dealer group, has the obligation to send fee renewal notices and seek confirmation that their client wishes to renew the ongoing fee arrangement. Does Colonial take any steps to ascertain if fee disclosure statements have been sent by the financial advisor? <coughs> so what we do is uh, require our licensees, of dealers, to enter into a dealer terms of trade uh, with us. Yes. That, um, warrant that where they're providing us a warranty that they will uh, comply with their obligations. Does Colonial take any steps to ascertain if a fee disclosure statement has been provided before deducting the fee? We, uh, we're not involved in the process of sending the fee disclosure statement. This is something we have given consideration to, uh, what our role could or should be in relation to this. We first considered this uh, when we were introducing uh, FOFA and becoming aware that licensees would have this obligation to see whether that was a service uh, that we could or should assist with. What we found, though, was because the, the fee uh, and the part of the relationship that's visible to us is just in relation to this product, that we didn't have visibility of the, the whole relationship and often somebody can hold more than one products. Plus of the, the key interactions that happen under this agreement, uh, for example, one of the most valuable parts of the service often is the face-to-face -face, uh, annual renewal, is not something we're a party to. So the view we take is that we are interested in assuring that the fee is properly incurred in relation to the, the part of the fee that relates to, to this product, but we don't have a process by which we're monitoring or supervising the sending of the FDS. Mm. We're using the dealer terms of trade to ensure that uh, they are uh, obligated uh, to advise us through the dealer terms of trade if that doesn't occur, right. the licensees. Well, I'll come back to the dealer terms of trade in a moment. I think there might be two concepts being conflated in your answer. The first is that I asked about is fee disclosure statements. Yes. And fee disclosure statements are separate from, but in some sense related to the delivery of ongoing service. Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. So the question that I asked was whether Colonial takes any steps to ascertain if fee disclosure statements have been provided. We don't. We require the licensee to advise us if the renewal doesn't occur. And while you've pointed to some difficulties that you might have in ascertaining whether service has been provided under an ongoing service fee arrangement, there, it's not the same difficulties in ascertaining whether or not a fee disclosure statement has been provided, are there? There could be. For the, the, the relevant licensee would need to look at the fee disclosure statement and then potentially send to each of the product providers assurance. So the fee disclosure statement would relate to all of the products and services that's being received under that statement, Yes. of which a single product would be one of the services. So Single product being one of your platforms? It, it could be, yep. yep. Yes. Yep. And so by seeing a statement of the type that you've just described, you'd be satisfied that there had been disclosure made in respect of your platform? 
Sorry, I didn't understand the question. If you saw a fee disclosure statement that expressly included a reference to one of your products, you would be comfortable that there was, there had been disclosure made? Yes. And that would give you a level of comfort in deducting fees? Yes, and the way we receive that comfort is by requiring licensees to notify us if that doesn't occur or if the renewal doesn't occur. Because the obligation lies with them. The obligation lies with them. The other, uh, the other piece of this that I think is important is the additional disclosure. So if we start with uh, what the client sees, which is the fee disclosure statement, uh, and then of course they've got the two year renewal process in regard to what their advisor sends them. In, relation, in addition to that, their disclosure from us as their product provider will clearly set out the fees that are, that are related to their holding in that product. So we are, that, that disclosure of the fees that relate to the holding in, in the product or platform that's relevant to me is disclosure that I'm also continually making uh, visible to the customer. I see. So in that regard, the customer also has the opportunity to turn the fee off at any time or to be aware if, if they haven't, been received, haven't received the fee disclosure or the renewal process. Do you accept that it's a large step to deduct an amount from a client's investment? It, it, absolutely, yes. And it could be a particularly large step because of the compounding effect of fees being taken from yes, client I investments? Yes, I do accept that, yes. And you could require, couldn't you, dealer groups to confirm in respect of each client that they have fulfilled their obligation in respect of fee disclosure statements. That's not beyond possibility. It's not beyond possibility, but I think we would want to understand what the system capability would be required uh, for that versus at the moment what we have is the obligation for them to advise us when a failure occurs. Well, there's any number of methods, aren't there? At one end of the spectrum, for example, you might require positive proof of the fact that a fee disclosure yes. statement's been provided. Yes. And perhaps <clears throat> at the less rigorous end, you might conduct randomised auditing of the licensees to see whether or not they have been provided. Yes, that's right. But at this point, you don't do either. We're not doing uh, the auditing, but I, I, think, I think you're right. I think that is uh, steps that we could add to the way we're administering the dealer terms of trade that would improve. You say steps we could add. Is there any current plan to add? Uh, it, to be honest, I, I think through the course of the Commission this week, uh, there, there has been, in, in, uh, it will be something that I will be going back to the office and doing, yes. All right. Yep. You've mentioned the um, dealer terms of trade. Can I take you to paragraph 31 of your statement, please? And you'll see at the second sentence there, that it's on the screen or you can use your hard copy, that you impose rules and limitations in terms of trade that are binding on each relevant dealer group, yes. which includes an obligation on each dealer group to comply with its obligations under relevant law. Yes. And then if we go to paragraph 32, you give some detail of the terms of trade with dealer groups including a requirement that dealer groups comply with statutory ongoing fee arrangements uh, and requirements. And that paragraph concludes with a reference to subclause 2.1c of the dealer terms of trade that require the dealer group to comply with the financial services law, which includes the relevant Corporations Act obligations. And that's the type of obligation that you were alluding to in your evidence a little earlier. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yes. How would Colonial become aware that a dealer group was in breach of a statutory obligation? We would expect the dealer group to um, adv advise us. Insofar as the dealer group concerned is affiliated, that is it's a Commonwealth Bank subsidiary for example, say CFPL, the contractual terms that you've pointed to in paragraph 32 are not enforceable in any practical sense, are they? Uh, yes, they are because we could, uh, we, we could off board, we couldn't cease to deal with the relevant yeah. licensee. Sorry, it, what was your answer? We you could, could stop dealing them. with them. Stop we, dealing we within the group? 
uh, or any. Uh, uh, you were asked about company within the group. Are you we, we could telling that. me that you could cease to deal within the group? The, the power would be there for us to I do that. And the power yeah. may be there. Are you telling me that's a realistic possibility? I would think that that would, would be unlikely, uh, but not impossible. And I think it would... The governance structure we have in place across these entities, they are governed by independent uh, boards. Mm. So I do think it would be possible, but I would, I would agree that it would be unlikely, and, and hopefully because we would have knowledge... Uh, of, of the steps being taken to remedy any situation. Well, let me put a few possible. things to you in that connection. It's inconceivable, isn't it, that Colonial would sue another Commonwealth bank entity for breach of that sort of a term? I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. The situation hasn't arisen. Um, it hasn't arisen. Point. I think that's the point. <laughs> it hasn't arisen yet. Go on. Is your, when you say it hasn't arisen, what do you mean? There hasn't been a case I've been involved in where we've been considering that. But it certainly has arisen that affiliated entities have breached their obligations under the Corporations Act, hasn't it? Yes, that has happened. And what you, when you say it hasn't happened, what you mean is you haven't considered whether to take any action as a consequence of a breach? No, what I'm saying is we knowing the action that the the entity was taking uh, satisfied us that we we didn't need to consider uh, taking any further action, that rather what we were focused on was ensuring that the relevant entity was uh, appropriately considering uh, remediation and redress where that had occurred or if that was necessary for the clients. It's inconceivable, isn't it, that you would kick CFPL off a platform? I would have to agree that that would be unlikely. I don't know that it's inconceivable. I said with independent board structures, it's possible, but I do agree with what you're saying. Yes. Colonial's a wholly owned subsidiary of yes, Commonwealth, Commonwealth Bank. Bank, ultimately. Yes. And do you understand whether or not the directors of the company are ultimately allowed to act in the interests of the ultimate holding company? Uh, no, we're, we're there to act in the interests of our investors. Yet you say it is almost inconceivable that you would remove CFPL from a platform if it was, say, in egregious breach of its Corporations Act obligations. But I know in that case it would be conceivable because of the, you know, at least because of the independent uh, board structure. I'm saying in the cases that have occurred, we were satisfied with the actions that the licensee was taking in regard to remediating for the customers that we are responsible for. How many non Commonwealth Bank entities have you taken action against for Corporations Act breaches? I, I couldn't. There have been licensees uh, that have been um, off-boarded, but I, I don't know the answer to that. We'd have to let you know. When did that last happen, to your knowledge? Uh, I, I, I would have to check. I'm not sure. Yeah. Do you, are you aware of it occurring since August 2012 when you started in your current role? It may have, I'm not sure. And you've mentioned a few times the board and the role of the board. Would a decision to take action as a consequence of a breach of dealer terms of trade be a decision that would ordinarily reside in the board? No, but if, if, it, if it escalate, well, I would rather, the, the, if the board became concerned, it could go either way. It could be management uh, alerting the board through the risk committee, or it, or it could be management itself um, taking action. Well, assume for a moment that it's a decision of management. Mm -hmm. Whose decision is it? Yours? It would be my decision uh, to, to instigate that uh, with the board or to escalate up, in, up my management line. To who? Both of those avenues. Who would you escalate it to? Initially, to, uh, you know, up my... Rep at the moment, the Chief Operating Officer who I report to. Is that the Chief Operating Officer of the Commonwealth Bank? No, of... Well, initially, the escalation would be to my immediate boss. Who is? Uh, Michael Venter, the Chief Chief Operating Officer. Of what? Of the Wealth Management Division. Of the Commonwealth Bank? I would also have ability to escalate uh, directly with, uh, with the Executive Committee. I would also have ability to escalate uh, directly 
uh, with the CBA board if I, if, if I thought that was warranted. With the CBA board? I could do that, yes, I could raise an issue. Why would you raise with the CBA board whether or not it was appropriate for two separate legal entities with their own contractual arrangements to take action against another Commonwealth Bank entity? I don't think that's the context in which I, I meant that. Uh, if, if CIFSL was going to take action against another C CBA entity, you're right, that, that would be with the CIFSL board, yes. Sorry, you... I was talking about management escalations on the issue. I see. Yes. You're aware of the fees for no service issues that Commonwealth Bank has had? Yes, I am. And you know that Commonwealth Bank group entities have charged more fees for no service than any other financial services entity in the country? Do you know that? I do know that. It would be the gold medalist if ASIC was handing out medals for fees for no service, wouldn't it? Yes. And at any point in time, have you considered whether or not it is appropriate for the entities that you manage to take action of any kind in respect of the deduction of fees from client accounts that you manage? Sorry, say that again. Take action. In the case of uh, Commonwealth Financial Planning, uh, we were satisfied that Commonwealth uh, Financial Planning and CBA were, were um, investigating and, and remediating where this issue had occurred. When did you become satisfied of that fact? The, uh, the open advice review uh, in, in 2014 is when uh, it, it was very obvious the extent to which, uh, as I said, both Commonwealth Bank and the licensee were, um, were investigating not only the fee for no service issue, but issues uh, within the within the Commonwealth Bank, actually in two in sorry in 2014, uh, the issues were uh, related to inappropriate advice. I think out of those investigations and the the desire to look further, the the fee for no service issue arose. Just as I put to you earlier that you could require the licensee to certify that a fee disclosure statement's been received, you could do the same in respect of the provision of ongoing advice, couldn't you? We could do it, yes. Have you thought about doing it? We have thought about doing it. Um, sorry, I, sorry, are you, are you saying again the renewal notice? No, I'm not. I'm saying, I'm saying separately to the renewal notice, the issue or one of the issues that Commonwealth Financial Planning and other entities within the group um, is in a remediation program for is the provision, uh, is the charging of fees without receiving a service. Yes. You understand that? I do. And in many cases, those fees would have been deducted from, uh, by way of platforms that you operate. Yes. And I'm asking you if at any point you have considered whether or not it would be appropriate for you to require the dealer groups to certify in respect of each customer that they have complied with their obligations to provide service. Well, I'm using the dealer terms of trade. Um, to do that, and, and I do agree we should look at how we could strengthen the way we're administering that dealer terms but of trade. But you're not really using the dealer terms of trade to do that, are you? You're just pointing to the fact that there was, there is at least a possibility that if you wanted to, you could do something. In relation to the uh, Commonwealth Financial Planning incident, as I've already said to you, when we became aware of the matter, we were also aware of the open advice review and the seriousness with which uh, they were taking around that the, the remediation. Um, I, I can certainly assure you as the product issuer, I was very unhappy at what was happening. <coughs> Excuse me. But I, I uh, did believe that allowing uh, Commonwealth Financial Planning to investigate and carry out their remediation was the best, uh, was going to get the best outcome for our members. Did you consider whether you had any independent obligation to remediate your members? Uh, again, because we were satisfied that they were going to be remediated, I, I didn't consider that. I did, however, consider uh, and have considered in hindsight, now that we can see the full extent of what happened, I have turned my mind to what could I have done differently or was there in, uh, interventions that I could have taken and I would still, uh, even looking back in hindsight, say 
that allowing um, Commonwealth Financial Planning to carry out the investigation and remediation was what gave the best result to the end customers. If I, with the limited knowledge and view I had of the issue, was trying to make unilateral decisions or impose my own uh, outcomes, it actually could have either confused the remediation or, uh, in some cases, even caused a detriment for the client. While it might be the gold medalist, Commonwealth Bank's not the only entity that's had fee-for-no-service problems? Yes. Have you written to any other dealer groups seeking any confirmation in respect of the provision of fees-for-no-service? No, again, we're relying on the dealer terms of trade. But I asked you earlier, how would it be that you would become aware of a dealer group breaching an, obligations, uh, an obligation <coughs> pardon me, under the Corporations Act that would engage the dealer terms of trade? And your answer to me was you would expect them to self-report. Is that right? That, that is right. All right. You understand, don't you, that fee disclosure statements were brought in as part of the FOFA regime? Yes. And that at least part of the purpose of fee disclosure statements is it minimises the prospect of passive arrangements where fees are being deducted without services being provided. Yes. And notwithstanding that that, well, that is one of the intentions of fee disclosure statements, you still haven't put in place any regime to satisfy yourself that they're being issued. Not in relation to the fee disclosure statements, uh, but the improvements that we have put in place. We did also, uh, in CIFSL, update the um, terms of trade to have specific clauses in relation to the um, opt-in provisions. And in addition, as I've said, to the fee disclosure statement, the renewal process, we've also done a lot of work to improve our own disclosure to the customer in relation to those fees. We carried out uh, a major, what we call a customer-centred design piece of work around the periodic statement um, to ensure that we were at best practice in terms of how we were disclosing ourselves the, the fees that related uh, to those services to customers. And in the case of um, Commonwealth Financial Planning, where um, they're using the first choice platform, uh, over that same period of time, we've also made that periodic disclosure available because one of the other problems we see sometimes is people don't necessarily engage with their statement as much as we'd like. So we've made those statements available to them in the NetBank uh, portal and the, and the ComBank app to increase uh, the presence of them and the visibility of the fees for the customer. And those statements would typically, in respect of an ongoing service arrangement, say something like advisor service fee? Yes. And has that been changed? Changed? In the, in the improvements that you've just been speaking about, has there been any change to the way that ongoing service fees are presented on the statement that the consumer looks at? It's the entirety of the statement and the way it looks and the way um, the, the transactions are made very clear and that the label on the fee, of course, they're separated out and labelled as advisor service fees. Was that not the case before this project that you're speaking of now? The project that I'm speaking of improved the overall readability of the statement. Um, so it, it has been an issue uh, in our industry that um, customers do find uh, disclosure uh, hard to understand and we were aware of that. And as we were moving into the FOFA regime alongside the fee disclosure statement, uh, we wanted to uh, carry out this piece of work so that we could get even more comfort that our statements uh, were uh, able to be read and understood by customers. So a lot of the, the change is in the, in the layout and design and clarity uh, of the statement. Is there an explanation in the statements of what an advisor service fee is? I'd have to check whether... Uh, I, I think they're... There is, but I'd have to check that it's You think that, that there is? There. I'd, have to, I'd have to check as to what the written explanation is. Uh, the, in the statement, what is very clear is the dollar amount uh, coming out of their account and the impact that has on their account. Yes, I understand that. But my question was, is there a statement <coughs> within the document that explains what an advisor service fee is? I don't have it in front of me. I think there would be, but I don't want to say that definitively if I don't have it in, in front of me. I said yeah. the fee is very clear and there are um, notes, at, you know, as well as the statement, there's, there's notes attached, yes. Have there been any other major changes to your business as a consequence of the FOFA reform? 
So, obviously, the implementation of the FOF, all of the things that that we've um, we've we've spoken about, um, are the the changes that we've undergone. Yeah. And those changes, if I can summarise them quickly, are <coughs> the banning on shelf yes. space and volume fees, subject to two exceptions, the grandfathering of commissions. Yes. Anything else? Uh, that, well, there's been a range of regulatory reforms over that time. I'm sorry, I'm going. I'm just trying to so understand obviously how we implemented all of FOFA. Yes. Yeah. Um, but in so far as how you interact with a consumer, the principal change to your biz internal business processes as a consequence of FOFA is the redesign of the statement to try and give greater visibility of the fees? Is that your evidence? Actually, the redesign of the statement wasn't necessarily a, a FOFA initiative. Uh, it, it was an initiative probably that we would have undertaken anyway, but it certainly does complement. Uh, we're continually looking for improvement and way, ways to do things uh, ways to do things better, and the statement would fit into that category. Uh, but it was um, of comfort to us that it ensured that the disclosure in relation to those fees was clearer. If you were to take some of the steps that we've spoken of in the course of your evidence today, directed to ensuring that clients have a better understanding of their fee, the fees that they are being charged and requiring uh, your business to have a better understanding of whether or not those fees have been properly disclosed and whether service has been properly provided, would that reflect itself in an additional fee? Sorry, I didn't understand. Would you, would you increase the fees that Are you, you charge? Are you talking about the regulatory reform it, fee? Yes. Yes. Is that a separate fee? That is a separate, uh, a separate fee that uh, we, we've been charging in order to recoup some of the regulatory reform costs. And how's that fee calculated? We, uh, in the first year, well, every year we carry out a process of looking at the regulatory reform, and this is not just FOFA, this is all of the regulatory reform that has been um, undertaken over that period. And we then, you know, consider of that what is appropriate to be passed on uh, in regard to ensuring that it's not part of already duplicated in the administration fee that is, that is um, genuinely uh, additional cost that Sorry, if I go back a step, the alternative would have been to have to have increased the administration uh, fee. Yes. Rather than doing that, our view was to uh, calculate uh, what's appropriate to be uh, passed on uh, with a view that, and charge that annually with a view that that fee uh, will, will cease at some point. When did you first start charging that fee? Um, I think the date is in my witness statement. I'd have to Do check. you remember the year? Is it 2012? Was it before FOFA? Uh, sorry, I've gone. I can't remember the date, but it's it all right. would be in the fee table. But it's been charged for some years. Yes, it has. And is it charged as a flat fee, applied equally to all, or is it charged as on a prorated basis of a total, charged by funds under management? Yeah, it's 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 uh, included in the. It's charged uh, by redeeming units from the uh, individual account. But what's the basis upon which the redemption takes place? Is it funds under management? Uh, it, it differs. It, it, it part of the consideration in charging the fee, there's, and there's a cap. So the details are, are in my witness statement. All right, but just let me ask a simple question. Is it calculated by reference to funds under management? Uh, I believe in some cases, yes. When you say some cases, do you mean some years, or do you mean it's charged in a different way for different products? There's a, there's a cap as well. No, no, no. My question was... Yes, the answer is yes. No, I, I'm not sure the answer can sensibly be yes. My question was, when you say it's charged differently in different ways, do you mean it's charged in different ways in different years? Or do no. you mean it's charged in different ways in respect of different products? Different products. Different products. So some products the consumers would pay, what did you describe it as, a regulatory reform reform charge yeah. fee uh, based on funds under management and others would pay it on a differential basis, perhaps a fixed fee? Uh, I, yeah, I, I need the detail in front of me. All right. The okay. detail is in my, my witness statement. All right. And that's been charged 
for some years now. Is there any plan at the moment for when that charge might stop? We assess it every year in relation to what has occurred. Our plan is for the fee to stop and that's why it's separate. Do you recall now how that fee is described in statements sent to customers? Uh, I'd, I'd need to see the statement, but it would be disclosed in the statement, yes. As a separate line item? Uh, I believe so, yes. And um, do you know if on the statement there would be an explanation of what that fee is, or would that explanation come from another document? I think it is on the statement, but without it in front of me, I don't want to be categoric. Thank you. Commissioner, I have no further questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, can I just take you back, Ms Elkins, to the uh, uh, dealer terms of trade uh, point? They can include an obligation on each dealer group to comply with its obligations under relevant laws. Can you explain to me how making a contract with someone that they will obey the law has any effect? It's a, it's a warranty and, and the obligation is to um, inform us uh, where, uh, where, where that's not the case. That's right. So the term is not just to obey the law, but is there an express term in the dealer terms to report any breach? Yes, there is. I see. Anything arising out of that, Mr Costello? No, thank you, Commissioner. No, thank you. Is, is any party other than Commonwealth Bank seek leave to cross-examine? No, very well. Anything in? Nothing further, Commissioner. No. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Elkins. Thank you. I step down. You're excused. Where to, uh, Mr Hodge? The next witness is Ms Perkovich. Could we just take a five-minute break to again do a reorganisation and then we'll keep going? Certainly. If I come back at... Uh, uh, shortly before 20 to 1. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.